Well, like Tyler said, my name is Marcella Tarantino and I am in Gunnison, Colorado. And I work on sage grouse habitat conservation. Um, so that's what all of our uh, presentation is on today. Um, so to start, just a quick little intro to Zoom. Um, if you guys haven't used Zoom before, um, just so that you guys are aware of how it's set up, you can um, mute and uh, quit your video here down in the green um, circled section. And then there's a chat box here. Um, so, and if you have trouble getting this to show up, you just kind of hover your mouse down at the bottom and that should allow you to um, click on items. But we'll use the chat box a lot throughout the presentation so that you guys can um, ask questions or make comments or throw out ideas. Um, so that'll probably be something really handy for you. You can um, click on it and dock it next to the presentation um, so that it's easy to see. And when you're using the chat box, um, go ahead and make sure it's to everyone so that we can see and answer your questions. So, um, so to get started, we like to get an idea of where everybody is from um, and how many people are watching with you, um, just so we have an idea of who's attending our programs and um, get a little bit of an idea of what their interests are. So please go ahead and type into the chat box where you're from, how many people you're watching with, and what your uh, most recent neat bird that you saw was. Looks like so far, kind of all over. Um, a lot of folks from Colorado, um, Alberta, very cool. Um, cool. Um, so um, here's Tyler and I. <laughs> and um, I would say my favorite bird that I've seen somewhat recently was a white tailed ptarmigan just because I think they're really neat. Um, and one of the more unique grouse species. So Tyler, do you have a favorite lately? Yeah, I, uh, I was actually out in North Carolina for Thanksgiving and I finally saw a Carolina chickadee, which I've actually probably heard before when I was there, but I never actually put two and two together because they look just like a black cat chickadee. Um, <laughs> but that was my favorite. Very cool. All right. Um, there we go. All right, so for those of you guys who aren't familiar with Bird Conservancy yet, um, our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. And for each of those primary goals, then there is an associated team that works on those um, interests. So there's a science team that works to advance knowledge, the stewardship team that collaborates on conservation delivery projects, and then the education team that inspires the next generation and holds fantastic webinar series like these. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about stewardship throughout the presentation so that you guys can learn a little bit about what our team does and how we work to conserve birds and in particular ones like grouse. So Bird Conservancy is interested in birds for a variety of reasons. Um, they've been inspirational to people for um, centuries and they're found in artwork, engineering, literature, all of those kinds of things. Um, they're really accessible. So no matter where you live or what season it is, you can almost always find a bird where mammals and even some plants are a lot more difficult to see or to watch um, in winter or in certain locations. So that's one reason that birds are really great to um, inspire people. And then, they're also really important for ecosystem services, which are um, services like pest control and seed dispersal and pollination and things like that that people really rely on. And then finally, uh, birds are great environmental indicators. So when people talk about the canary in the coal mine, um, they're really sensitive to environmental changes. And we'll talk about this a lot in respect to grouse because they are particularly sensitive um, to a lot of fragmentation and other habitat issues. So this webinar, um, the main goals are to help you guys learn what makes a grouse a grouse, um, because they are kind of a unique group of birds, and uh, learn to identify different species within the US 
and then uh, learn why grouse are sensitive to habitat changes in maybe more so than some of the other birds that um, we look at. So the reason I wanted to cover um, grouse is that uh, they're one of my favorite groups of birds. They're <clears throat> typically really drab and kind of hard to see throughout the year, but <clears throat> excuse me, they have these really unique breeding displays that are um, just fascinating to watch and they make these crazy noises. And um, so I think they're a really fun group um, just because they're unique in their activities. Um, and also it's what I work on every day. <laughs> and um, they're also a really vulnerable group of birds. So I think it's important to raise awareness about um, their situation and um, help people start to learn a little bit more about them. So to start out, um, we're gonna look at just what is a grouse. Um, so they're in a group of birds called galliforms. And these are relatively large ground dwelling and chicken like birds. Um, so all of them look roughly like a chicken and range in size from um, a little bit smaller than your average chicken um, to even a little bit larger. And uh, one of their really cool characteristics is that they have a lek breeding system for some of the species, not all, um, but a lek is a gathering of males where females will come and uh, take a look at all of them and um, decide which one to mate with. So it's a really unique breeding system um, where the females are making the choice entirely and it's um, really up to the males to just come show up and work as hard as they can every morning. Um, and like I said, it's uh, not every single grouse species, but it is a really common trait and that's not a common uh, breeding system in all of the animal kingdom really. Um, so throughout the um, presentation, I have a couple of videos of lek displays, um, but I, I didn't have time to put every species in there. So I would definitely encourage you guys afterwards to look up some of the other grouse species because it's, I would say, watching videos or watching in person um, any of the lek displays is probably one of the reasons that people really, really like grouse. Um, another kind of unique characteristic is that um, they have all sorts of unique feathers. So uh, most of the year they have cryptic feathers so that they can hide really easily. Um, because they are ground dwelling birds, they have to be able to hide um, since they don't usually fly away um, as easily. And they have some unique characteristics that uh, help with their breeding displays. So I'll point some of those feathers out in each of the later pictures. And then they also have a lot of feathers that are specialized for cold environments where they live. So they have double feathers where it's an outside feather that has a lot of color and then an inside feather that's really downy um, that helps them stay warm. And then this picture shows all of these little feathers on the outside of their feet, which are um, just really scaly, thick feathers that act kind of like snowshoes. So birds can walk on top of snow really easily. And then they're one of the few birds that have um, feathers all the way down their legs to help them stay warm again. Um, and another really interesting thing about grouse is that they're primarily herbivores. So they eat um, shrubs, wildflowers, twigs, and they often eat plants that um, are considered toxic. So they have these really unique digestive systems that are somewhat similar to rabbits and um, other mammals um, to help them handle all those odd foods that they eat. Um, and then another important fact is that chicks need a little bit more protein to grow, so they'll eat um, insects while they're growing up. So we'll talk a little bit about that from a conservation perspective later. And coming back to this idea of them being environmental indicators, um, they're probably a little bit more sensitive to some habitat changes than other birds are because they're residents. Um, so they don't make huge movements. Um, I think the longest grouse movements have been documented, documented around 100 miles or so. So in the grand scheme of bird migration, it's really pretty small. Um, so that makes them particularly sensitive to habitat disturbances in the small area they live in because they don't really move to a further location to get away from it. Um, 
I also wanted to just mention real quick how many grouse there are because I don't think people know a lot about this group as a whole. So there are 25 species of grouse in the world. One of those is extinct, so they only have 24 living species left. Um, and they live in northern latitudes with a circumpolar distribution. So they're everywhere from um, all over there in Europe. There are quite a few different species. And then there are a couple in Asia. Um, they live in kind of all around the Arctic Circle, Alaska, Canada, and North America. Um, and the farthest south species we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, but um, it, the farthest south is Texas. So um, that's not too far south compared to a lot of other birds that, we'll, that uh, Bird Conservancy has had webinars on in the past. Um, and then in the United States, we have uh, 12 of those species. Um, and again, one of those is the extinct one. So we actually only have 11 species living in the United States now. Um, and of those, we actually have seven in Colorado, which is kind of amazing. Um, and one of those species has multiple subspecies. So we have eight subspecies of grouse. And so Colorado is actually the most diverse state in the uh, country as far as grouse go. Um, there are a couple other states that have pretty close numbers but have fewer subspecies and that kind of thing. So um, Washington, Montana, and Idaho are our next highest numbers of grouse per state. And the thing to notice about all of those states is they all have mountains and they all have plains. Um, and that habitat diversity provides a pretty wide range of variability for grouse to live in. And so that results in having a few more species than um, some of the other areas. And so in this presentation, I'm gonna cover all of the grouse of Colorado. Um, and I know that doesn't cover everywhere, um, but it does cover a pretty good proportion of grouse in the country. And then I'll make notes and kind of talk about some of the other species um, that are closely related as we go through different groups of birds. So. Hopefully, if you're not from Colorado, hopefully it'll still give you a good idea of what grouse might be in your area. So um, if you guys have attended these webinars in the past, um, we'll go through a little section where I show some photos and teach you guys about different grouse species. So it's really helpful to get out a field guide or a birding app or something along those lines to help you narrow down birds to a species or a group of grouse. Um, if you do know right away, Give others a little bit of a chance to look up the bird in their guide. Um, and if you don't want it spoiled for you and you're still looking it up, I would recommend hiding the chat box or ignoring it while you give yourself a moment to look it up. Um, and remember to do your best. Um, the pictures aren't to scale, so um, that makes it a little more difficult for some species to tell what it is. And they're only looking at it from one angle, so you're not gonna have all of the characteristics visible every time. Um, and grouse are a pretty tough group to identify. So um, just give it a try, see how you do, um, and remember that it's totally okay to be wrong and that it's a learning experience. So um, I'm excited to see what you guys already know about grouse and um, get a little bit of an idea of um, what your background is to start with. So, all right, so we'll move on to the first species. Um, this species likes to live down in the plains, um, sometimes in some shrubland habitats, but mostly on the plains. And um, the most distinctive characteristic is this really pointy tail, um, where all of the feathers are kind of bunched up together into a single tail. And some other important characteristics are that when they display, they have these weird purple air sacs and these yellow eye cones. And so the eye cones are just this skin um, that they kind of puff up when they're displaying. And then the air sacs are actually part of the bird's esophagus and they expand those really quickly um, to fill them with air and that makes a lot of their noises while they're displaying to females. So um, I'll show that in the video, but these guys are found um, in a pretty wide area across the United States and Canada. Um, and there are six subspecies of this. So this is the one that Colorado has two subspecies of, um, here. So if you guys have made your guesses, this is a sharp-tailed grouse, which gets its name from that really pointy tail there. And um, I wanted to play a video of them because I think they are so cool. They look like little airplanes moving around. And so they make their noises as they do their mating dance with their feet and with their air sacs. 
So those guys have one of the more unique dances that I think is really entertaining. Um, so our next species here um, is also a plain species. They mostly like grasslands, maybe sometimes a little bit of shrubland, um, but they really prefer grasslands. And they have this really round tail up top, um, which is an important characteristic. And then they have these barred, um, sections across their whole body. And on the female down here, you'll see that the bars are pretty light, so they don't always go all the way across her chest. So that's a really important characteristic for this species. Um, they have these dark, these are called pinnae feathers that are on top of their head. And when they're displaying, they hold them erect like that. And then when they're um, not, like if they're scared or they're um, just feeding at the end of the day or something like that, they hold those pinnae down so it looks kind of like a little mullet or something like that. So it's kind of a goofy look. Um, and these guys have kind of reddish, orangish, yellow eye uh, combs and air sacs. And this is another lecking species um, living out on the plains. It's really easy to kind of be visible and project sound. Um, it's easy for females to find and view from. Uh, so lecking species are really common on the plains and shrublands. Um, so if you guys have made your guesses, this is the lesser prairie chicken. Um, and one of the good tips, if you're looking at the prairie chicken page, uh, one of the easier ways to figure it out is just the range map. So um, these guys are found in South Central United States and uh, the red here is all of the area they used to live in and yellow is where they live in currently. So um, definitely a restricted range and there are only about 22,000 to 41,000 birds of this species left. Um, so they're somewhat vulnerable here um, and are in decline currently. So, um, our next species is really closely related and if you were on the Lesser Prairie Chicken page you probably have already figured out what this guy is. Um, they also have a rounded tail and barred feathers but you can see that these feathers are really, really darkly barred and you can't really see the belly particularly well, but the bars do extend all the way through the belly. Um, they also have those pinnae feathers on top of their head and they have the same color air sacs and eye combs. Um, it's another lecking species and it used to have a pretty huge range if you look at that map, um, but now that yellow area is much smaller. Um, so, it is the greater prairie chicken. Um, these guys have a pretty um, relatively large population estimate for grouse. They're, it's thought that there are about 700,000 of them, um, but there are estimates of about a 91% decline over the last 40 years. So um, they're definitely considered a vulnerable species as well. And then a couple other notes about closely related species. So down here in Texas, this little yellow spot, that is the Atwater's prairie chicken, which um, is a subspecies of rare prairie chicken. And they are the farthest south grouse species in the world, um, which is a kind of cool fact. And um, they, there are not a lot of Atwater's prairie chickens left. Um, so they're probably one of the most vulnerable species of grouse or subspecies. And then if you look over here on the east coast, um, this is, you don't see any yellow. So this is the extinct population of grouse that used to exist in North America. That's the heath hen. Um, and so they went extinct quite a while ago. Um, but so I don't have any pictures up for either of those species, but they were pretty similar to greater prairie chicken. And I wanted to play a video of them too. They use their air sacs. Um, their display is called a booming display. So um, you might need to turn up the volume on this because it's a little bit on the quiet end with a low frequency.
So males will compete for the best spot on the lick. Um, they're not actually fighting like deer or elk do to control a harem or something like that. They're just fighting for the best spot so that they're most visible to females and that hopefully attracts females um, to mate with. So that's just part of a normal lecking behavior. All right, our next bird, this is moving a little bit further west now. These guys inhabit most of the Western United States. Um, they have what we would consider, a, this is a very common ornithological term of a spiky tail. <laughs> um, so unlike the sharp tail grouse where all of those feathers come to a single point, each individual feather is visible here. And so it, um, I thought it was best described as a spiky tail. And uh, these guys have the phyloplumes, which is essentially a hair-like feather. So that's these feathers at the top of its head. And in this species, they're kind of fine and wispy. And I think um, they look somewhat like a little balding old man. So apologies to any um, fellow out, fellows out there without any hair, but that is what a greater sage grouse reminds me of. And they have yellow air sacs and yellow eye combs. And they're also a lecking species, um, which again is kind of common in species that live in open habitats because it's easy for them to find the lex and see what's going on. So if you guys have made your guesses, this is a greater sage grouse. Um, they are one of the largest grouse in North America and second largest in the world. And they are also a species of decline or of concern due to declining populations. The global population is thought to be somewhere around 150,000 birds um, and they've had about a 40% decline over the last 40 years. So um, if you look at the range map here, um, the dark green is areas they currently live and then the light green is areas that they used to. Um, so they occupy about 50% of the habitat that they used to. And here's a really cool video. Oop of their display, um, they make their noises with vocalizations and then with their air sacs. And then they also make a swish there with their feathers, those white feathers swishing against their wing feathers. Um, and I think this video is really cool because at the end it shows um, a slowed down version. So you can see where all these crazy sounds come from. So that uh, last slow motion section is um, all occurs within a couple of seconds. So it's a, kind of amazing that they can squeeze that much motion into a short amount of time. So our next species is another one where if you're on the greater sage grouse page, you've probably immediately figured out what this bird is. Um, again, they have a spiky tail, but this time they have white stripes. So if you remember from greater sage grouse, they had kind of a mottled tail that um, was mostly brown with a little some kind of white flecks here and there but these guys have a barred white tail so it's a little bit more distinctive and then their phyloplumes are really long and thick comparatively so they um, look a little bit more like a set of pigtails or something like that they also have yellow air sacs and yellow eye cones um, and they're a little bit smaller than our last bird that we just looked at and they're also lecking species and they live in a pretty restricted area in southwest Colorado and southeastern Utah. So this is the Gunnison sage grouse. Um, so again, pretty similar to greater sage grouse in a lot of respects. Um, these guys are um, listed federally as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And their global population is estimated to be between 1,400 to 1,700 individuals. 
and they only use about 90% of the habitat that they are thought to have used um, in the 1800s. So now we are moving into the forest grouse species. Um, we have a few forest grouse in Colorado, um, barely for this guy. Um, it only lives in a really small section of Colorado. Um, but this is the most common forest grouse and the most, most common um, grouse in all of uh, Canada and the United States. So you can see in the map it covers 38 out of 49 continental states and all of the Canadian provinces. Um, and it's mostly identifiable by this black collar, um, and that's how it gets its name. It has a round tail, which is kind of hard to tell from this picture, um, and it doesn't use air sacs or eye cones, but instead its dis display has this really rapid wing beat pattern. So I'll, I'll show a video of that because it's really unique compared to a lot of the other grouse species. And then the males and the females match. So um, the males are a little bit um, less flamboyant, I guess you could say, um, compared to some of those plains grouse that have the eye sacs and that, or sorry, the eye cones and air sacs visible. Um, and then this is a non-lecking species, which is, um, if you think about the habitat they live in, it's really hard for other birds to find each other in a forest. So having a whole group of males together doesn't make as much sense as having males kind of dispersed throughout the landscape that are a little easier for females to find. So um, so anyways, it's a non lecking bird. And if you guys have made your guesses, it is a ruffed grouse. Um, so again, they're probably one of the most common grouse in the United States, although not in Colorado or uh, any of the southern states. So I do have a video of these guys. Um, I would definitely recommend turning up the volume on this because it's a really low frequency. But this is them uh, using that wing beat pattern to make sounds for females. I think they sound like a lawnmower or a airplane propeller or something like that taking off. So our next species is another one of the forest grouse. Um, this is probably one of the more numerous grouse species in the Rocky Mountains. Um, they used to be in the blue grouse species. So if you have an older um, field guide, it may still list it as a blue grouse because um, that was not a distinction that happened that long ago. Um, they, these guys have a rounded tail with a band on the tip, which is kind of hard to see in this photo. Um, but that's one of the distinctive characteristics between this species and the other that was split out from blue grouse. And then they have a red air sac and a red eye comb. And the males and the females look remarkably similar, especially in their non-breeding season plumage. Um, and again, these are a non-lecking bird species. Um, so if you guys have gotten in your guesses, this is a dusky grouse. Um, the other closely related species is a sooty grouse. Um, they were split out based on some uh, different behavior and uh, things like the tail band and some genetic work. Um, and these are one of the more numerous species thought that there are around 3 million birds out there. Um, and they are in decline, um, but not as precipitous as some of the other species. And our last grouse species in Colorado is um, an alpine inhabitant. So for them to do particularly well in the alpine, they actually have two really distinct molts. So, there's the top one for winter, um, which helps them blend into the snow. And then in summer, they have a totally different molt that blends in with the lichen and the rocks and all of the uh, low growing alpine vegetation. And they don't use air sacs in a display, but they do have red eye cones that can show up in a display. And you can just barely see a little bit of a red eye comb right there. Um, and those kind of uh, puff up during displays. So this is um, not during a display here. And 
like I said, this is an alpine inhabitant, so um, they do go extend all the way into Canada and Alaska, um, and then there are some kind of dispersed populations throughout the Rocky Mountains. So these, those of you guys who guessed it, it is a white-tailed ptarmigan. There are multiple other species of ptarmigan found in um, both Canada, Alaska, and then also really across um, all of the circumpolar regions. So rock ptarmigan and willow ptarmigan are two of the other grouse species in the world. Um, and they're relatively numerous uh, compared to some of the other species. Um, for white-tailed ptarmigan, there aren't really any good estimates of population, but breeding bird surveys show a decline of um, estimated around 96% over the last 40 years. So um, they're a little bit trickier because the habitat they live in is protected and so there's not a lot of development going on and there's not that much fragmentation um, because a lot of it is forest service or park service. Um, but um, it's thought that part of that decline could be due to climate change because these really, really distinct molt patterns make them super visible. If um, say you're starting to get later and later snow pack um, and they're molting early, then they stick out like a sore thumb because they're white in the brown habitat. So that could be part of the issue for these guys. So they're a little bit different from their conservation concerns compared to a lot of the other grouse. So it is time now for your grouse quiz. So I have a few different slides for the quizzes. So these are numbered from one to four. Um, so take a look through your guide and try to figure out what you think each one is. Go ahead and type it into the chat bar whenever you're ready. Um, and then we'll go through and give you guys all of the identification um, after you guys get a chance to think about it for a second. All right, I'm giving you the answers. So the first one is a ruffed grouse. And um, one of the great clues you can use for grouse is habitat. So you can see all of the little um, saplings and seedlings growing behind it. So you know it's one of the two forest grouse. And for this one, you can just see a little bit of his black collar there. So that gives you a clue. And then this picture shows his rounded tail really, really well. And he kind of looks like he's puffed up and about to start that wing beat display too, so that helps. Um, oh, and I guess the other characteristic I didn't really mention um, is they also have this little teeny bit of a mohawk. And then our next bird, I did not show you guys a picture of them in molt previously, but this is a white-tailed ptarmigan, and you could probably tell because it was molting. Um, and it's such a drastic difference between that white belly and then some of these barred feathers that are part of their summer uh, just, or summer molt. And then number three was a dusky grouse. Um, you could tell based on the red air sacs and eye comb. And the red color is somewhat distinctive. There aren't that many grouse that have a red uh, air sac. And then um, this picture really shows that kind of light colored band on the top of their tail. So that's a really important characteristic for them. And then our last one is a sharp-tailed grouse, which um, sh this pointy tail should be the main clue for that, but also you could look at their air sacs and eye combs on that as well. Our next one, I call this our bonus points quiz because this is our really closely related species. So um, if you can get it to species, that's amazing. And I'm super happy if any of you guys get that. Um, but if you can just get it to where they live or what uh, general type of grouse they are, that's awesome too. All right, we're getting a couple guesses in there. You guys are doing pretty well. All right, these are really hard to tell apart. Um, 
And I actually often see the wrong photo in scientific presentations. So even some scientists will get it wrong too. Um, so we have first a great and you can tell based on the really wispy phyloplumes um, and then the mottled tail. And then the next one is Gunnison and it thick ponytail and then this barred tail. So those are the main uh, differences between those two, other than size, but that's kind of hard to tell from a photo. <laughs> um, and then the last two are prairie chickens. So we have the greater prairie chicken, which has this really dark banding, and then the lesser prairie chicken that has the light banding that's almost faded away in the center. So um, awesome job to anybody who got it. And uh, they're, they're really hard to tell apart. So um, it's a, definitely a learning experience, so don't be upset if you didn't get them yet. <laughs> um, and then our next one, oops, having trouble getting this to pop up. Um, all right, this one I call the so many bonus points quiz. Um, these are all non-breeding birds which are a little bit harder to tell apart because you can't see their eye sacs, um, or sorry, their air sacs. Um, you can see one eye comb on here that'll give you a little bit of a clue. But non-breeding birds are really difficult to tell apart because they are meant to blend into their environment. So there aren't a ton of characteristics that are visible on them. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys a few clues. So on this one, you can see a little bit of a red eye comb. Um, so that, gives you a bit of a hint here. Um, and it looks like there's a little bit of a light band on the tail. Number two um, is in an open habitat. It's really mottled, has a little bit of a pointy tail here. Um, and this one is kind of hard to tell uh, from some of the other species. Then we have over here, some banding and particularly light banding across the chest. And then this one is up in a tree, which gives you a little bit of a hint um, and has that little bit of a mohawk. All right, looks like we are getting some answers already. Um, so we have first a dusky grouse, which um, is that red eye comb and the uh, band on the tail help. And you might look at these and say like, the dusky grouse and the greater sage grouse are both really modeled, um, so they look somewhat similar. And some of the differences are that the sage grouse is a little bit more brown and the dusky grouse is more gray and drab. And then another important characteristic is that sage grouse have this black belly, which I did not talk about at all, so that's not a helpful trait when you're actually taking the quiz, but now you know. <laughs> And then they also have um, almost like cat eye eyeliner or something like that that extends past their eye, this little white stripe. And then next is a lesser prairie chicken. Um, this one is a hen and uh, it has that light barring that barely crosses the chest. And then the last one is a ruffed grouse. And again, it kind of has similar modeling like the dusky grouse, but it has a little bit of a buffy color here instead of that drab uh, gray or brown. Um, and it has that little bit of a mohawk. And then the other kind of unique characteristic between it and a dusky grouse is that it has this little light buffy um, stripe across its eye. So for anybody who got those, that's amazing. Um, that's really impressive. And I'm um, glad to hear you guys got those. Um, so I also really quickly just wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of one of the unifying things for grouse. And, I think I mentioned this in all of the species descriptions, um, but every species I discussed is in decline. Um, and that's also true for most of the species across um, the US that I didn't discuss, as well as across the world. And some of the characteristics of their behavior are why that happens. And so one is that they're non-migratory, but they have large home ranges. So um, they need a large expanse of space to be able to survive throughout the year because they move between some little seasonal habitats, um, but they're not making major moves like to um, one year they're gonna be in Utah and then the next year they're gonna be in Montana. Um, they mostly stick to one area. Um, so a disturbance in one area is going to have a major impact on 
part of their life cycle. And then they're also what's called highly philopatric. So they return to the same site every year. So there have been um, cases where they've documented hens that nest within a couple hundred yards of a previous nesting attempt. And um, for a lot of species, it's presumed that males will come to the same lek most years and most days. Um, and there are even some really great examples of um, for Gunnison sage grouse when they put in a dam and filled up Blue Mesa Reservoir for several years after that, uh, there were birds that would strut on top of the ice where the reservoir had flooded their lek. So they were like 40 feet suspended above where they had previously displayed um, because that's where their lek was and they weren't going to change it. Um, and that's not a great characteristic in the respect that um, that opens them up to predation because they don't have any cover on the reservoir. Um, and they are somewhat uh, sensitive there to changes in temperature, like if ice is melting or something like that. So um, that philopatric nature is, um, in one respect, it lends itself really well to conservation because we have a pretty good idea of where they're gonna be. Um, but the downside is if there's an impact to one of those really important locations, they're still gonna go right back there. Um, like this picture of sage grouse displaying in front of an oil rig. So that's a really important characteristic that makes them pretty sensitive. And then the other major issue is that um, a lot of the habitats these birds live in are changing pretty rapidly. So um, grasslands for sharp-tailed and the prairie chicken species are one of the habitats that's experiencing pretty rapid conversion to cropland and other land uses. And then same with sagebrush shrublands, which are also experiencing some pretty dramatic changes. So um, those changes to the habitat have pretty huge impacts on grouse. But I don't want to leave it on a sad note here <laughs> um, because there are so many problems facing grouse that that means there are so many solutions that we can implement. So um, what the stewardship team with Bird Conservancy does is work on habitat restoration for a wide variety of bird species. And my job is focused on Gunnison sage grouse. And there are other biologists throughout the range that work with either sage grouse or um, some work with lesser prairie chicken and some work with uh, dusky grouse and all sorts of things. So um, we kind of have some unifying uh, threats across the ranges. So um, the, the big exception I would say is uh, ptarmigan just because their habitat is so different and the ownership of that habitat is so different from the other grouse species. But um, conifer encroachment is a huge issue for the shrubland and grassland birds. So whether it's eastern red cedar coming into the grasslands or it's pinyon and juniper coming into sagebrush shrublands, those trees are not part of that natural landscape and they provide perches for predators that make it a little easier for them to pick off chicks or find nests and eat the eggs. And so one of the relatively simple things we can do is uh, conifer removal to help return that to more of a natural landscape. And then one of the other major um, conservation methods is to restore some degraded meadows. So um, meadows are really important for all species of grouse because they have relatively high protein plants that they can eat. And then it, um, that wetness also provides great habitat for insects, which are a really important food source for chicks. So um, using and I know this is a really small picture, but these little uh, rock dams essentially can be used to help slow erosion and uh, build up soils and restore that habitat for particularly for chicks while they're growing up. Um, and wet meadow degradation is caused by all sorts of things from road build, building to old wagon trails. So um, that's a pretty consistent problem across several species ranges. Another huge, huge issue facing grouse is invasive species. And um, I put in a picture of cheatgrass and sagebrush because I think it's one of the biggest issues that any grouse species faces. Um, cheatgrass is an invasive uh, annual grass that um, comes in and it builds up fine fuels and can cause more fires than would have typically existed in a sagebrush landscape. Sagebrush does not return well after fire. Um, and so it can convert to a monoculture of an invasive species, which doesn't provide good food or cover for birds 
in that area. So um, invasive species can be a huge, huge issue. Um, so most of the stewardship team will also focus on removing invasive species and then seeding with natives um, to improve the cover and food for native birds there. And then fire is another huge issue for grouse and it kind of goes both ways. So in on the plains, uh, fire frequency used to be really frequent and we don't have that frequency anymore. And so that can really change what plants grow in an area. Um, and then in the woodland and sagebrush habitats, we are seeing less frequent fires, largely due to fire suppression, um, that has built up fuels over a long time to have these really, really massive and hot, severe fires that can result in completely converting the landscape to a different habitat type and over a large scale. So fire is a really important factor in habitat and it can go both ways as far as too, too frequent or not frequent enough. Um, and so that has a big impact on habitat. And so proper fire and fuels management is also an important aspect of restoration. And then the last issue is a really, really important issue for probably all of the grouse, with the exception of ptarmigan, since they live up so high. Um, and I think it's one of the biggest issues in the respect that development and particularly anthropogenic or like human structures is a pretty permanent land use change. So sometimes grouse have um, habitat fragmentation because land is being converted to cropland or something like that. And that can be restored. It's not easy, um, but it can be restored. Whereas if there's a home that goes in, that's probably gonna be a home for the foreseeable future. And so managing development in a way that maintains habitat that's contiguous for birds. So where you don't have little houses dotting the landscape and all of the associated roads and telephone poles and all of that kind of infrastructure is a really, really important for most of the grouse species as well. So if you're concerned about grouse, I just wanted to put in a plug um, for, if you have an interest in um, this issue, if you have land, I would encourage you to contact a private lands wildlife biologist in your area. So this is a map of all of the biologists that uh, Bird Conservancy has. We are, um, have a bunch in Colorado and then kind of dispersed throughout the Great Plains and Rocky Mountain area. Um, if you don't live in one of these areas, don't be concerned. There are private lands wildlife biologists that work for multiple organizations. So I would, um, if you have land and have an interest in doing some habitat restoration, then uh, feel free to get in contact with us and we can kind of point you in the right direction if you're not in one of these areas. And if you don't have land, that's totally fine. Um, you can also support organizations that help conserve and protect grouse habitat. So that's another way you can affect change. And I know this is a really tough year. So if you don't have the ability to um, support any of those organizations, you can also still support conservation by just sharing your knowledge about grouse and um, trying to help raise awareness for the issue because it is um, a pretty big issue across the area. And so, the more people know about it, the better off everybody is in uh, solving the issue. So um, if you need it, the contact info for any of the stewardship biologists is on the Bird Conservancy website. So I'd encourage you guys to check that out. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I really appreciate you guys attending and I'll hand it back over to Tyler. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marcella. That was great. I know I took it and learned so much uh, about grass that I didn't previously know. So thank you so much for, for sharing all your knowledge and, and information, that was great. Um, before we get to our little like keep in touch and uh, before people start leaving, we do have a couple questions uh, that I just wanna hand straight over to you, Marcel, since you're the grouse expert here. Um, so just a couple quick questions. We had a question from Karen about where you got those range maps from. Um, what oh, was that's, yeah, um, I got them from a few different sources. So. Um, most of them are from the ICUN. I always forget what that stands for. It's international uh, something. <laughs> um, but so from the Red List organization that uh, ranks vulnerability. So most of them are from there. Um, but I also got some other maps like for Gunnison Sage Grouse and Greater Sage Grouse. I got those from um, the Western Agencies of um, Fish and Wildlife Association. 
uh, for greater sage grouse, and then I got the Gunnison sage grouse one. Range-wide conservation plan, so uh, kind of a hodgepodge of sources. Um, and then my estimates of the number of species per state I got off of eBird. Nice, yeah, great, great sources. Um, we have another question uh, from Heidi. She asked, what are the top five places to see grouse in Colorado? Ooh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, gosh, so, um, so grouse, it would kind of depend on what time of year you go. So um, grouse are relatively easy to see for the lecking species while they're displaying. So um, they visit these really distinct spots on the landscape and um, are pretty consistent in when they show up. So. Um, if you're interested in seeing birds lecking, which I would say is by far the most fun way to view grouse, um, there are a few ways you can get in touch with people to see them. Um, there are bird, and I, I guess I don't know about during COVID times, but um, there are frequently bird tours that kind of hit, they'll take like a week and hit every lecking species in the state. Um, and if that's a little bit outside of your means, because they are not cheap, I don't think, I've never done one, but, um, you can also kind of hodgepodge your own together and um, you can get in contact with, I would say the parks and wildlife offices and they might be willing to share. Some of the LECs are protected locations so they probably won't give them out to everyone but like in Gunnison we have a, a public viewing LEC. So um, I know that doesn't specifically help but if you do want to help kind of do like a DIY tour, um, you could probably reach out to, um, I guess the email on here and they can pass it on to me and I can try to get you in contact with some of the appropriate um, folks that could help you out in the local areas that would know best where, where you can see them. Cool, thanks Marcella. And even if, uh, if y'all are familiar with eBird too, you can also look in areas um, and see if anyone's sighted any grouse. Uh, I know you can find white-tailed ptarmigan pretty regularly up on Trail Ridge Road uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park. I've had some good luck up there. Um, so just two more quick questions. Um, this one was pretty interesting. Linda was wondering uh, if grouse are, if they're able to adapt and move their habitat um, if it comes degraded. That's a great question. So um, they'll definitely, well, I, I shouldn't say definitely, they will, will likely come back to the habitat when it's degraded, whether that's in their best interest or not. Um, they adapt from what we know, which is honestly not that much, um, we do know that they will come back after restoration pretty quickly. So there's been a little bit of research with conifer removal where um, once people take out trees, it took a couple of months for grouse to come back. So um, I, I guess you could say it's somewhat adaptable, but I would say as a whole compared to other species of birds, I would say they're pretty inflexible and they don't do a great job at adapting and moving to different locations. Yeah, that's a great answer. All right, so our last one, um, which it might be kind of hard to, to touch on just because it is a wide kind of a, uh, we'll probably eventually do a webinar on this, but uh, do you have any advice for young professionals wanting to pursue a career working in grouse conservation? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think, so the bright side is that um, there are, a ton of jobs in grouse work because uh, so many of the species are in decline that um, you can get technician jobs uh, where you kind of work um, in the field doing things like trapping or um, doing let counts and all of that kind of work um, across because they inhabit so much of North America you could get a job almost anywhere in the US doing some sort of work with grouse and I would definitely recommend getting um, going both to your undergraduate and graduate school, um, you can always find positions in grouse work. And uh, I think there's a pretty good chance of um, staying, if you wanna work solely with grouse, there are a fair number of opportunities. So um, if you need any specific ideas, always feel free to reach out. Um, all, a lot of our private lands wildlife biologists have done research or work in the past, um, either starting out or currently with grouse. So um, you can always reach out to somebody for more specific ideas too, if you want. Yeah, that's great. And I know uh, a lot of us at the education team, we are 
we're creating a pretty big document um, about how to get into conservation or wildlife or education careers and, and our paths that we've taken. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to share that, that information uh, in one way or another, because our whole point of our organization is definitely to get future conservationists and future wildlife biologists, um, because we need to continue this work. Um, but thank you so, so much, Marcella. Uh, you rocked it. You did such a great job with this webinar. And thank you all so much for attending. Um, if you are in a position where you can help uh, donate, we are a nonprofit and we do rely pretty heavily um, on donations and we really, really appreciate it. Uh, you can find information on donating on our website. Um, and I will also include a lot of information on my follow-up email. Um, this webinar was also recorded. Uh, so we'll have it up on our YouTube channel uh, at the end of today, probably, uh, or at least by the end of the week. Um, we will be back in January. January, we will be continuing our webinar series. Um, I know I have a lot of fun making them. Marcella said she learned a whole bunch of stuff making it. Um, and we do want to get more folks from our science and stewardship um, and uh, as the education team as well. Um, so we will continue doing this webinar series. So keep a lookout on our Facebook or our website. Um, and again, thank you so much to Marcella for all your time in building this. And thank you all so much for attending. And I hope you all have a, a safe and great end of your year. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.